Okay, everyone remember the series that we're in? <clears throat> we return this morning to the early chapters of Revelation. We continue with the seven churches in Asia Minor. We're now ready for Christ's message to the believers in Sardis, which is found in the first six verses of chapter 3. So the message itself, um, this one's a little different in the sense that there's no specific enemies or threats that are mentioned. There's no Balaam or Jezebel or Nicolaitans or the synagogue of Satan and so on. And the language used to describe their failures and offenses, is it's general, it's kind of vague, and no details are really given. And consequently, of all the congregations there in Western Asia, we know the least about the church in Sardis and about the problems uh, that they are having there. But we can piece together some things from the text itself and from the historical information about the city, and we have quite a bit of information about the city of Sardis itself, and so we can kind of maybe put things together and, and make some assumptions. One thing that stands out from the passage is that the situation there, it's quite a bit different than the other three, than the last three churches that we looked at. Believers in Smyrna, Pergamum, and Thyatira, if you will remember, they found themselves in conflict with the culture of those towns, and that conflict brought about the threat of persecution. And at least even in Pergamum, that, that persecution involved the threat of martyrdom. But that is not the case here. It appears that Christians in Sardis, for the most part, they're free from harassment. They're able to live peaceful and happy lives, even enjoy a certain degree of prosperity. In fact, it doesn't even look like the church is having to battle against any false prophets or heresies, from what we can tell. And as we will see, the church has enjoyed a reputation among other churches in the region of being alive and spirit-filled and on fire and enjoying growth and revival. It was a happening place, the church that all other churches wanted to be, we, we would speculate. And so things are quite comfortable for them and things are going well, maybe a bit too well. Comfort and easy living usually leads to complacency and overconfidence and laziness and a shift of priorities. And things tend to be taken for granted that shouldn't be taken for granted, and um, diligence and attentiveness um, often slack off. I think we can all relate to that. <clears throat> so Sardis is number five on our list of the previous four that we looked at. All of them have had relevant lessons for us, and that will prove to be the case again today. Some things will probably hit pretty close to home, other things not so much, and hopefully the areas that are relevant will be pretty obvious. So we will begin like we have with the others with some background information about the city itself. And this then, it's quite important because it will provide the setting for Christ's message to the believers there in Sardis. And we will then work through the passage itself, giving most of our attention to what it was that warranted Christ's firm rebukes and warnings. And um, in the eyes of everyone, members and outsiders alike, the church there is healthy, vibrant, alive, but in the eyes of Jesus, as we will read later, it is on its deathbed and will soon die unless it makes a quick and radical recovery. All right, so about Sardis itself, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> as we leave the city of Thyatira, Sardis, it's the next stop on the travel route. It's about 30 or 40 miles south. It was one of the oldest cities in Asia Minor with a lot of rich and interesting history, having been founded way back in 1200 BC, long time ago, a long time even before this letter was written. And it served as the um, capital, the Lydian Empire, an empire that was known for its extravagant wealth. And before the Romans took it over, it had been, uh, in previous centuries, one of the most powerful and wealthiest and glorious cities of the whole world, especially um, in the ancient world. And, but by the time Revelation was written, most of its splendor had now become a thing of, of the past. Nonetheless, it continued to be quite prosperous and wealthy, and this for several reasons. Sardis was ideally positioned at the intersection of five major trade routes, which itself drew in lots of commerce and trade. And like Thyatira that we looked at last week, it thrived in the textiles, wool and fabrics and various dyes to color those fabrics. But most of its wealth came from the river that ran right through it, and this river was rich in gold. In fact, this is the very city where coins were first minted coins made of gold, and historians have noted that Sardis is really the place where modern money was born, because before that, there was not an exchange of money. It all began in Sardis. 
And it seems to be fitting, given that in its day, this was one of the wealthiest cities around. And we could assume that the Christians there, before their conversions, they enjoyed lives that prospered from either this gold or from the production of wool and dyes or from other commerce that prospered from these major these five major trade routes. And we can assume that that really didn't change that much after the conversions. They enjoyed to live fairly prosperous lives. The wealth gave the residents there, everybody, a kind of sense of security. Their financial situation was sound and the future seemed promising as well, safe. And um, they not only felt secure financially, but also secure in their ability to defend themselves from external threats. This is all kind of interesting. Um, that, that is, they were safe from any army that might try to take it. And this has to do with the way that it was located. At the time Revelation was written, the city had two main parts. The old part, the old back in the glory days of the past, was situated up on the top of a very high hill and very steep. And this made it to be an, an ideal fortress. It's just it, virtually impossible to overtake. The newer part was in the valley below where the river was and where all the trade routes came together. And this was the part that thrived and thrived economically and where everybody lived. And under Roman rule, it would be, of course, unlikely that an enemy would try to advance against it. But the old part of the city was still there um, that they could resort to just in case there was a threat. And the steep hill on which it was sat there up up. Uh, which, which the city sat, rose a good 1,500 feet above the valley. And three sides of that hill consisted of smooth, perpendicular, straight 90-degree-up cliffs that no army could possibly climb um, those flat rock walls. It was just virtually impenetrable. Did I say that right? Close enough. So the backside to the south was a struggle to climb as well, but that was still doable. And so this was, and this is where the entrance was, and there were gates there that were well fortified. And so the city is quite secure. And simply put, Sardis was one of the safest cities in the ancient world, if not the safest. And this, along with their wealth, gave the residents there a sense of this, you know, security. And that would have been even more so in earlier centuries, but it was still true during the time of this writing. Now, to complete the picture here, and it's relevant for appreciating something in our passage, there was a time, 547 B.C., when Cyrus the Great, king of Persia, I think we've all have heard of him, he advanced upon the city to take it. This was before it had developed in the valley below. Everybody's up on that steep hill. The authorities of Sardis felt so confident of their safety and security that they didn't even bother to post guards on top of the cliffs. It was no big deal. That army could not possibly climb up it. And so here, just for a moment, we might think of those remarkable documentaries of, of, that have filmed rock climbers going up the dawn wall of El Capitan in Yosemite National Park. Anyone ever seen any of those documentaries? That is stuff is so fascinating. Um, the Dawn Wall, 3,000 feet straight up, is said to be the world's toughest wall to climb. But people have done it. And it's an amazing thing to watch. And they've done it without ropes. And they grab a hold of something like a half-inch ledge, you know, once every eight feet. And they're just like, it's just amazing. They're like superheroes or something, supermen. And they grab some little hole that you can barely get your thumb inside of. And they use that stuff to climb up. Well, Cyrus found someone in his army who had this unique ability. And it was just one soldier, not the whole army, but that's all he needed was just one person. So he scaled up that 1,500-foot high flat cliff in the cover of night. He was able to sneak through the city, found his way to the entrance, opened the gates from the inside, and let the army in that was hiding out nearby. And so Cyrus took the city. And the unthinkable happened. This was just something that no one had ever expected could even take place. So that is bad enough. Pretty embarrassing, but the same thing happened again centuries later under another king, and um, you would have thought that by now the you know Sardis would you know get learn the lesson, <laughs> but they didn't. And so here's how all this works out. Now this lack of watchfulness became something that Sardis was known for and actually ridiculed about. The whole story was throughout the ancient world told over and over, not just for entertainment, and it was entertaining, but also for education. Teachers used it as a moral lesson when instructing their students about pride and complacency and overconfidence. And Sardis itself became synonymous with this moral lesson. 
And so when the warning Jesus so the warning that Jesus gives there in verse 2, be watchful, be alert, should definitely resonate with them, assuming that they know their history. So even as the city fell because it let its guard down, so will you fall if you do not do the same. And as in history, so it is with the faith to consider oneself secure and um, to fail to remain alert and to have too much confidence in yourself and in your resources is, of course, to court disaster. And that's what we will be seeing here when we read the passage. So the wealth of Sardis and its fortress at the top of the hill gave the people there, of course, this false and it was a false sense of security. And in the same way, the church's reputation there for being alive gave it a false sense of security. Another point about Sardis worth noting is that it was not, at the time of this writing, a center of emperor worship, unlike the other, many of the other cities that we've looked at. It was not a capital city like Pergamum. It was not a military post like Thyatira. And it was not eternally grateful to Rome like Smyrna. And so people there were obviously under Rome's power, but there was no indication that it had a cult-like devotion to Rome. And so again, Christians there were relatively safe in that regard. And we don't have really much information about idol worship at the time. We know that a temple was being built to Artemis, but it had not yet been finished um, when Revelation was written. And from all accounts, there doesn't appear to be any great pressure on Christians to join in pagan mills and festivals. And finally, it should be pointed out that Sardis was a name that generally had prompted contempt among outsiders. If you were from Sardis, folks considered you to be rich, arrogant, materialistic, and self-indulging. And you would be seen as one who had little or no morals and that all you cared about was living the high life, similar to how the rest of the world sees Americans today, right? <laughs> um, and somewhat interesting, the rest of the world regarded the men from Sardis as effeminate. Uh, the reputation is the reputation they had is that no men is that no man there had ever done an honest day's work, a hard day's work. They all had jobs that could be done by women, shopkeepers, and musicians, and so on. That's what I'm just saying. What the history book says, all right? Soft jobs for soft women. So if you were a man from Sardis along with all the other bad things that everybody thought of you, you also had to contend with this one as well. All right, so with that background in mind, let's now read through the text. And for those who might notice, I'm switching today from the 1984 NIV, which I really like, but I'm going to be using the Christian Standard Bible. The 1984, it's not being supported anymore. There's no digital versions available. It's kind of, it's kind of makes it a little difficult to use. The CSB is similar, so I'll be using it. And next week, I might do something different. I might try the message sometime. How many? That'd be a great, a great study Bible. All right. Uh, in John's vision, the glorified Christ tells him, write to the angel of the church in Sardis, thus says the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Be alert and strengthen what remains, which is about to die, for I have not found your works complete before my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you are not alert, I will come like a thief, and you will have no idea what hour I will come upon you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothes, and they will walk with me in white because they are worthy." In the same way, the one who conquers will be dressed in white clothes, and I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and before his angels. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. So again, Christ begins by um, identifying himself, and he does so as the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And um, even though the seven spirits of God are mentioned elsewhere in Revelation, we don't really know exactly what's being referred to here. Most commentators, as we pointed out earlier, believe that the better rendering of the phrase would be the seven-fold spirit of God, which is how the New Living Translation renders it. And this, so this would be, of course, referring to the perfect and complete Holy Spirit. And the church there, it's nearly dead, and it can only be revived if they yield to the Spirit who is eager to work in their lives and transform them. And the fact that Jesus has the Spirit and sends the Spirit testifies to his um, own sovereignty. 
He also identifies himself as the one who has the seven stars. We know from chapter 1 that these seven stars represent the seven different angels, each assigned to seven churches. Uh, We talked about these seven angels back in January, the different possibilities, what might be going on with them. Uh, So without repeating all that now, the point that stands out is that Jesus holds them. That is, they operate under his authority. It seems then that the main point Jesus is making here in the opening statement is his sovereignty over them. He cares for them, he shepherds them, he loves them, and yet as their master, he rules over them and he expects their loyalty, faithfulness, obedience, and submission. And now for the sentence that drives the, that actually drives the whole passage. I know your works, you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. All right, I know your works. These are words that should sound familiar. We've heard them before, and Jesus often uses them to lead into words of praise and other positive comments. Uh, you might remember last week, he says I, to Thyatira, I know your works, your love, faith, service, and perseverance, and so on. But not here. The works that Jesus knows are works that warrant a rebuke, not praise. You have a reputation for being alive. Others are impressed by what you have accomplished. Your works have earned you quite a name for success. But I, the sovereign one, know those works. I truly know them, inside out. I know the motives behind them. I know everything about them, and this is what I know. I know that these works reveal that you are not alive at all, contrary to what everybody else may think. I know that you are dead. So Jesus doesn't offer any specifics here. Perhaps these works were that he's referring to are sins, uh, or more likely, the works involved outward activities that the world would define as successful, but in reality were simply empty and hollow, had no real genuine value, or maybe it's a bit of both. Here we are left, of course, to some measure of speculation. Given that Christians there didn't face any threats of imminent or serious persecution, and that they probably all enjoyed a certain level of prosperity, and very important, they had this reputation of being vibrant and alive and spiritual. You know, they were the envy of other churches in the region. Well, all this certainly contributed to a a degree of complacency and and contentment, Um, even a false sense of security regarding their walk with Christ. And they were able to just kind of coast along in their faith with no worries about whether that faith was well anchored and sound or whether it was superficial. Um, Not a hard thing to imagine. I think we can all relate to this. It takes work. It takes effort. It takes commitment to have a walk that is characterized by obedience and righteousness. It just doesn't naturally happen. Work and effort to grow and mature, and, um, you know, they simply lack the motivation to do that. I think we often struggle with that. We just lack the motivation of doing it. You know, it has to be di- intentional. It requires diligence. You can't just coast through it, just go through the motions, which probably is what's happening here. And like the reputation of the men there, they, you know, so was their faith. It was just soft. They probably thought to themselves that they were Christian enough, that they were mature enough, and that they were just sort of okay with all that. After all, they were all part of a church that had made a name for itself, and so everything is good. We could also assume that their prosperity may have proven to be a a real major setback here as well. Here we might think of the seed that fell among the weeds in the parable of the sower. We all know the story. The roots only go down so far. Nothing is produced because the crop is being choked out by the weeds, that is, by the riches and the pleasures of this world. Um, And so we might assume that these believers in Sardis, you know, they liked the comfortable, easy living. They were soft. They didn't really want to make the sacrifices necessary to be the people Christ intended them to be. And so on the outside, they had all kinds of things going on that made them look spiritual and successful. On the inside, however, as Jesus notes, because he sees with his, you know, omniscience, they were decaying, dying, dead. Now, we might imagine here, just for the purpose of kind of supposing, that if if the setting were today, the church in Sardis, you know, if the church was here in America today, we probably, they would probably have a large building, uh, three services on Sunday morning, one on Saturday night, accommodating thousands of people every weekend. They would have a bus ministry, a bookstore, a coffee bar, their own TV channel, and programs for every possible felt need out there. 
Their gatherings would involve lots of excitement with loud and lively songs complete with prophecies, claims of healings and miracles and moving testimonies and passionate sermons. It would be the happening church in town, successful in the eyes of believers and non-believers alike. And if you wanted to be where God was moving, as they say, this would be the place to be. But on this, I'm just speculating. Whatever was going on, you know, to kind of get a picture here, whatever's going on, they had a reputation. Everyone knew about the thriving church in Sardis, and every church wanted to be like them, we, could, we would assume. And, so, and we also know, quite clearly here, that Christ was not impressed by any of this. He examines their works, he examines their programs, he examines their activities, and with his omniscience, with his omniscient and perfect judgment, judges them as lacking. They are incomplete, he says, insufficient, and not what everyone believes them to be. And the sad truth is, quite frankly, you know, it's easier for churches then as it is today, it's easier for us to invest in things that are successful according to the world's standards than in what Christ actually wants. And again, there's nothing wrong here with large buildings, multiple services, lively songs, bus ministries, and programs. But it's easier to make those outward things the main focus and neglect the weightier things like discipleship. All that other stuff can be useful tools to help accomplish the objective, but they are not the objective itself. The goal, the objective, is living out the demands of the gospel, striving for godliness and righteousness, fostering an attitude of humility and gratitude in the members, an attitude of dependence on God, teaching them the scriptures and sound doctrine, and so on. The three short letters to Timothy and Titus, they clearly bear this out. Paul gives those church leaders specific instructions about how to care for their churches, what to do, what not to do, and what to teach them. It's all very clear. It's all very simple. It's not easy, but it is simple. But eager to make a name for themselves, churches often push biblical instructions off to the side in order to, as they say today, cast a bigger vision. So when the priorities are off and attention is directed from discipleship to any of this other stuff, churches start to die, even if for a season they appear to be alive and thriving on the outside. Think of the, um, we're all aware of this, the, the countless churches that have through the last few, few decades here bought into the seeker-friendly model, which is still popular. And obviously, you want to be friendly to those who are seeking the truth, but this, typic, this model typically is one where churches will do anything to get people inside the doors. And by nature, the model emphasizes God's love and grace at the expense of calling folks to repentance and helping them grapple with the offensiveness of sin. And as a result, such churches are largely populated with nominal believers, immature believers, or maybe even unbelievers who think they are believers. Again, we can't really say what's going on here in Sardis for sure, but it's easy to see how the message to them could be applied to churches in America today, right? The church in Sardis, from what we do know about them, could easily represent the modern congregation. All right, and now for the remedy, the solution. Because their works indicate a faith that is actually dead, Christ gives them a firm and direct exhortation, a way to turn things around. It consists of five commands, all focusing on their need for spiritual uh, vigilance. The first is be alert, which is how the CSB renders it, but most versions render the words with a bit more punch, which I prefer, which is wake up. You know, they have fallen asleep spiritually. They are allowing complacency, materialism, self-confidence, and other sins to invade the church. Twice before, the city fell to enemies because watchmen were not posted, believing falsely that diligence was unnecessary. And like the ancient city, Sardis, in ages past, they too are not attending to the matters they should be attending to and are on the verge of falling. The exhortation to be alert and to be watchful is one that's repeated throughout the New Testament. Here are a few of those passages. These are ones that will be familiar to you. In 1 Peter, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. 1 Corinthians 15, be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Acts 20, so be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning you. Each of you, day and night, with tears. Ephesians 6, stay alert and be persistent in all your prayers for 
um, all believers everywhere. Colossians 4, devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. 1 Thessalonians 5, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. 1 Peter 4, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. And many more, including a number of parables, quite, actually many, where the lesson is that of being alert, be ready, be watchful. Some are even warnings, not about the enemy, but about Christ himself and the judgment he will bring upon those who are not ready for his coming. And this, of course, is the issue here at Sardis, where he promises to come upon them like a thief. He will come when they least expect it, and he will come with his heavy hand of judgment and will bear down upon them if they don't snap out of it and wake up. This then leads to the second command here of restoration. The church must strengthen what little remains. Um, what they have is so weak, so sick, that it's about to die. It's got the picture here of it being on life support. But it's not too late. It can be revived. It, it can be strong and vibrant once again. Now, we don't know exactly, uh, you know, what's being referred to here on what remains to be strengthened. It could be referring to some small level of genuine faithfulness to the Lord that still is in that church, some measure of true spirituality that could be fostered. Or Jesus might have in mind that small minority of believers mentioned in verse 4 who have not yet defiled themselves, as he puts it. Perhaps Christ's words here are suggesting that they can help turn things around. Whatever the case, Sardis, again, needs to snap out of it and get on track. The words, I have not found your works complete, might be alluding uh, falsely to a picture here, word picture, to that unfinished temple of Artemis that was being built in Sardis at the time of this writing, something everyone in that church, everyone in town, would have been familiar with, and it would serve as a good illustration of the problem here. While under construction, it was useless as a temple, and if the project for some reason fizzled out, then all of it would be for nothing and the unfinished structure would become nothing more than ruins reminding future generations of the people's failure to complete it. And so it will be with the church in Sardis if they fail to act now and to act decisively. In fact, even the city's history and reputation ironically seems to reflect the situation in this church. As stated earlier, once had a thriving, Sardis once had a thriving reputation. Of the seven cities addressed in Revelation, this was the oldest, and at least for several centuries, the most glorious and most powerful uh, as well. But at the time of this writing, that glory had been lost. It was once alive and thriving, healthy, vibrant, but at the current time, it was living mar mostly off of a former but no longer existing fame. And relatively speaking, it's now a ghost town compared to what it once was. And so it will be with the church there as well. Um, if things don't change. And the parallel is one, hopefully, that they, will, that they would see. I'm sure that they did. <clears throat> the other three commands that Jesus gives, solutions to get them back on track, flow out of this warning regarding their spiritual deadness. Remember what you have received and heard. No doubt this is a reference to the gospel itself and to the charge to live lives worthy of that gospel that they have received. They need to get back to the basics, recall the message that was first shared with them. And then he goes on to say, keep it, that is, put it into practice, including the exhortations to grow, mature, and seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and not the pleasures of this world, including its riches and wealth. And finally, repent, which seems to sum up all the previous four commands. Repent, again, simply means a change of mind that results in a change of action. And so they need to get their priorities in order and put Christ first. They need to take their faith seriously and not just go through the motions. They need to renounce any and all the ways of the world that they have embraced. And they need to be alert, awake, watchful, not taking anything for granted, but faithful to rely on Christ their Lord rather than on their resources, wealth, and reputation. So as we read on in the, la on the rest of verse 3, we see the consequences for failing to act on his warnings. Jesus promises again to come to them, and he will come when they least expect it, like a thief. It's a vivid picture. Now, he is a bit vague, not giving any specifics about what he will do if he comes, but we know that it won't be pleasant based on the word upon. I will come upon you. 
And the ESV, again, probably renders the meaning here more accurately with, I will come against you. The word obviously conveys hostile opposition. The threat itself, just the threat, doesn't have to give details. The threat itself should be enough to ignite change, to wake them up and arouse them into a state of both repentance and readiness. Again, the image here would remind them of what happened in Sardis twice in the past, when, because people let down their guard, were overcome by the enemy in a way that they did not expect. A thief snuck in, opened the gates, and robbed them of their city. Well, the tone now changes in verses 4 and 5. Christ acknowledges that there is here in this dying congregation a righteous remnant, small as it may be. It seems that they might be the only hope for this terminally ill church. There are a few, as he says, who have not yet defiled their clothes, or in other translations, who have not yet soiled their clothes. And because, the manuf because of the manufacturing of and, and dying of woolen goods was a principal trade in Sardis, mentioning soiled clothes would, of course, be something they would all immediately recognize and uh, appreciate as a problem. And this, again, is before the day of fancy washing machines and effective, you know, efficient detergents, you know, getting dirt out of your garment was a major task. It, was a, it took all day beating, beating it against the rocks and water and all that stuff. We all see those movies, right? Those were the good old days, everybody says. <laughs> all right, so the meaning here is obvious. There are those who have not contaminated themselves with the worldly ways found in Sardis. They have not chased after riches and wealth. Rather, they have different priorities. They have adopted a sacrificial life of service. They have been faithful to grow and mature and to hunger and thirst for Christ and his righteousness. They are diligent in their faith, alert, watchful, ready, not complacent, not taking anything for granted. To them, success is not measured by the definitions of the world, but by the will and word of God. The promise to this undefiled minority is that they will walk with Christ dressed in white. Again, words that carry special significance here in Sardis. This promise then is extended to all who will follow their example, to all who in the church there will wake up and repent. As conquerors, victorious conquerors, as it mentions here, they will be part of Christ's triumphant procession, if you will, wearing white garments signifying their purity and eternal life. In addition to this, they are assured that their names will not be erased from the Lamb's Book of Life. Uh, the book that contains the names of all who are saved, of all who will enter into the kingdom of God in the future age. And with this, for the two go together, they are also assured that the glorified Christ will confess their names before God the Father and his angels. And the image here appears to be that of a courtroom where Christ steps forward as a witness testifying on behalf of the repentant, advocating for their eternal reward. And this, of course, is the positive side of not being erased from the book of life. All right, so in closing, we're way early again today. <clears throat> Is this a problem that we're getting out early? It's not a problem. I could do the sermon all over again. By... <laughs> all right, so in closing, in closing, a few comments on application. Don't need many here. I think a lot of this is pretty obvious, doesn't require much explanation. In many ways, as we know here, the city of Sardis seems to be very similar to all of America itself. Prosper prosperous, easy living, comfortable, self-confident, materialistic, soft, self-indulgent. And as Christians growing up in such a culture and living in it, well, we've been conditioned accordingly. There's, we just have. And that itself warrants a whole series of sermons, of course. And furthermore, we've been conditioned by the world's definition of success. The exhortations in First and Second Timothy and Titus, for instance, are relatively boring, quite frankly, and that's generally not the way we would view a vibrant church, a church that would adopt those exhortations and live by them. We would not really categorize them as a vibrant church according to the standards today, and therefore it's not something that Christians tend to pursue. But that's where we need to be. That's where we need to be pursuing. Along this line, we tend to think that, you know, we are Christian enough. That is, you know, to what degree we have been transformed in Christ's image, well, that should suffice. We're not all that intentional in growing and maturing in the faith, especially if it requires, you know, effort and work and time and that sort of thing. You know, it's enough to just believe the right things. We all believe the right things, don't we? It's enough to kind of attend church and be involved. 
that should count for something. And it's enough to pray and read the Bible daily. I mean, after all, that's a mark of discipleship. I mean, it's enough to, be, to not be addicted to the really bad sins going along in the world. You know, that's kind of the attitude we have, right? More or less. Am I the only one that kind of thinks this way occasionally? But our first love, the, you know, the thing that we are chasing after really comes down to it is you know, how, many can we, how, many, how many of us can honestly say that the thing that we're chasing after first and foremost is the kingdom of God and its righteousness, that that is our passion, that's what we hunger and thirst for. I think it's safe to say that our, you know, we struggle with this thing of having our priorities off. We confess Christ as Lord in our songs and prayers, but our lives are not really consistent with that confession. Though I would hope that we would want that, and, and I think that that is the case, but we can't just coast along. We have, to, you know, we have to be diligent here. Outwardly, we appear to be spiritually sound, but inwardly, you know, we might ask ourselves, am I de- are we as a church? Am I as an individual? Decaying, dying, spiritually dead. So again, I would think that Christ would, if he were here this morning, he would tell us to snap out of it before it is too late, to wake up, strengthen what remains, and repent. The church in Sardis reminds us that, you know, what it looks like to be vibrant spiritually, but may not actually be spiritual at all. All right, so I think those lessons are pretty obvious, and hopefully you will take those to heart. And um, next time we'll be looking at the church in in Philadelphia, that would be Philadelphia and eastern Pennsylvania, not the church, not Philadelphia, eastern Pennsylvania, but the one in western Asia. All right, next week we'll take a quick, a brief break from this series. We'll resume it in two weeks, but next week we'll take a brief break. Josh will be sharing, and um, we're looking forward to that. And um, are we telling the subject yet? It's from the Old Testament. It's from the Old Testament. Yeah, we'll find out next week. Okay, so let's stand and I will dismiss you with these words from 2 Thessalonians. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Upon that charge, you are dismissed. Go in Christ's name, enjoy each other, and serve each other in love.